Please subscribe, like, and share. It really helps us out. And of course, if you have any questions, comment below and we will answer you as soon as we can. Welcome to this video in our series on A-Level Economics. Topics covered today are as follows. 2.6, Macroeconomic Objectives and Policies, Part 1. If you haven't seen our previous videos, click on the card above. Let's start out today by looking at the possible macroeconomic objectives of the government. Governments intervene in the economy in an attempt to improve its economic performance. The government has four key macroeconomic objectives. 1. Economic growth. In the UK, the long-run trend of economic growth is about 2.5%. Governments aim to have sustainable economic growth for the long run. In emerging and developing economies, governments might aim to increase economic development before economic growth, which will improve living standards, increase life expectancy and improve literacy rates. 2. Low unemployment. Governments aim to have as near to full employment as possible. They account for frictional unemployment by aiming for an unemployment rate of around 3%. The labor force should also be employed in productive work. 3. Low and stable inflation. In the UK, the government target is 2%, measured by CPI. This aims to provide price stability for firms and consumers and will help them make decisions in the long run. If the inflation rate falls 1% outside the target, the governor of the Bank of England has to write a letter to the Chancellor of the Exchequer to explain why this has happened and what the bank intends to do about it. 4. Balance of payment equilibrium on the current account. This is important to allow the country to sustainably finance the current account, which is important for long-term growth. They have some other macroeconomic objectives as well. For instance, to balance the government's budget. This ensures the government keeps control of state borrowing, so the national debt does not escalate. This allows governments to borrow cheaply in the future should they need to and makes repayments easier. Also, an objective may be the protection of the environment. This aims to provide long-run environmental stability. It ensures resources used are not exploited, such as oil and natural gas, and that they are used sustainably, so future generations can access them too. Moreover, it means there is not excessive pollution. There may be a focus on greater income equality. This minimizes the gap between the rich and the poor. It is generally associated with a fairer society. To achieve their macroeconomic objectives, governments are able to manage demand through monetary or fiscal policy. In times of recession, they often increase aggregate demand to increase employment and economic growth whilst in a boom, they will decrease aggregate demand to decrease inflationary pressures. They may also use supply-side policies, which aim to bring about long-term growth. Firstly, let's consider demand-side policies. Demand-side policies are policies designed to manipulate consumer demand. Expansionary policy is aimed at increasing aggregate demand to bring about growth, whilst deflationary policy attempts to decrease aggregate demand to control inflation. Monetary policy is where the central bank or regulatory authority attempts to control the level of aggregate demand by altering base interest rates or the amount of money in the economy. Fiscal policy is the use of borrowing, government spending, and taxation to manipulate the level of aggregate demand and improve macroeconomic performance. Let's talk about monetary policy. Firstly, interest rates. The interest rate is the price of money and the central bank is able to change the official base rate in order to tackle inflation. This is called the repo rate. The rate the Bank of England will charge for short-term loans to other banks or financial institutions. A change in the repo rate affects market rates offered by banks to consumers and businesses as the Bank of England is the lender of last resort. If they are short of money, they will have to borrow from the bank at the repo rate and therefore they need to make sure that their interest rates are based on this rate so that they are able to make a reasonable return. A rise in interest rates causes a fall in aggregate demand through four key mechanisms. 1. The rise in interest rates will increase the cost of borrowing for firms and consumers. This will lead to a fall in investment and consumption, 
reducing aggregate demand. Two particular areas of consumption that will decrease are consumer durables and houses. Higher interest rates require higher rates of return for investment. It also makes savings more attractive, as the interest earned on them will be higher. 2. Since fewer people are borrowing and more are saving, there is a fall in demand for assets such as stocks, shares, and government bonds. This leads to a fall in prices for these assets. Therefore, consumers will experience a negative wealth effect since the value of their assets fall, which will lead to a fall in consumption. Moreover, investment is less attractive since firms are likely to see lower profits if prices fall. Aggregate demand falls because of the fall in consumption and investment. 3. People will become less confident about borrowing and spending if interest rates rise. The fall in consumer and business confidence leads to a fall in consumption and investment, causing a fall in aggregate demand. On top of this, other loans, such as mortgages, will become more expensive to repay and so consumers have to dedicate more of their income to pay back these debts. This means they have less income to spend on goods and services, so consumption will fall, causing aggregate demand to fall. 4. Higher rates will increase the incentive for foreigners to hold their money in British banks as they can see a higher rate of return. As a result, there will be increased demand for pounds and the value of the pound will rise. This means that imports will be cheaper, and exports will be more expensive. This decreases net trade and therefore aggregate demand. There are some problems with this method of demand management. Firstly, the exchange rate may be affected so much that exports fall significantly and imports rise significantly, causing a balance of trade deficit. Moreover, changes in interest rates take up to two years to have their full effect and small changes in interest rates may not affect people's decisions. Sometimes, interest rates are so low that they cannot be decreased any further to stimulate demand. This is a particular issue for many countries today, and something most people never thought would be a problem. There are a range of different interest rates and not all of them are affected by the Bank of England base rate. A lack of confidence in the economy may mean that, no matter how low interest rates are, consumers and businesses do not want to borrow or banks do not want to lend to them. High interest rates over a long period of time will discourage investment and decrease long-run aggregate supply. Okay, let's look at monetary supply, or, more specifically quantitative easing. This is when the Bank of England buys assets in exchange for money in order to increase the money supply and get money moving around the economy during times of very low demand. Quantitative means a set amount of money is being created and easing refers to reducing pressure on banks. It can prevent the liquidity trap, where even low interest rates cannot stimulate aggregate demand. One way of buying assets is for the Bank of England to simply increase the size of banks' accounts at the Bank of England, called the reserves, which encourages them to lend money. Following the financial crisis, the Bank of England found that many banks preferred to keep their money in reserves rather than lending it out so buying assets from the bank did not have the effect they wanted. As a result, the bank bought securities or bonds from private sector institutions such as insurance companies, pension funds, and banks. Quantitative easing has the effect of increasing consumption and investment, which increases aggregate demand and ensures the country meets its inflation target. Since the bank is buying assets, there is a rise in demand and so asset prices rise. This causes a positive wealth effect since shares and houses are worth more so people will increase their consumption. Moreover, the cost of borrowing will decrease as higher asset prices mean lower yields, or in other words, money earned from assets. Making it cheaper for households and businesses to finance spending. Moreover, the money supply increases. Private sector companies receive more money that they can spend on goods and services or other financial assets, which may increase investment or consumption and therefore increase aggregate demand. It may also push asset prices up further. Banks have higher reserves, meaning they can increase their lending to households and businesses so both consumption and investment increase as people can buy on credit. Commercial banks may lower their interest rates as they are receiving so much money from the Bank of England and so can offer very low interest deals to their customers. The increased money supply will mean that the price of money falls. Interest rates are the price of money. This will encourage borrowing, and therefore increase investment and consumption so increase aggregate demand. 
If many banks decide to lower their interest rates, the same mechanisms will apply as those following a reduction in the base rate. However, there are also problems with using quantitative easing. It is very risky and, if not controlled properly, could cause high inflation and even hyperinflation. Others say it would only lead to increased demand for second-hand goods which pushes up prices but does not increase aggregate demand. For example, it would not lead to more new houses being built but only second-hand houses becoming more expensive. There is no guarantee that higher asset prices lead to higher consumption through the wealth effect especially if confidence remains low. It had a large effect on the housing market by stimulating demand and leading to rapid price rises since 2013, helping to worsen the issues of geographical mobility. It also led to rising share prices which increases inequality, since the rich grow richer whilst the poor see none of the gains. It was not meant to be permanent and there are concerns that banks and economies are too dependent on quantitative easing, particularly within the Eurozone. Let's look at other methods that the government may employ. Open market operations, in order to reduce monetary supply. The central bank can sell more government securities on the open market. Securities are a promise by the government to pay a certain amount of money to the owner at a certain time and they are bought for less than their actual value. Their price is determined by the demand for them. When people buy securities, they pay for them with money drawn from banks and so there is a fall in the bank balances. This means banks need to reduce their lending so the money supply will fall. If they want to increase the monetary supply, the central bank can buy government securities. The central bank can force banks to hold certain assets as a percentage of their total assets, known as monetary base or reserve assets. This means they can control the amount of money that is loaned out and therefore the money supply. Moreover, the central bank can restrict a bank's ability to lend money or to who they are allowed to lend it to. So, what is the role of the Bank of England? Monetary policy is controlled by the Bank of England rather than the government. The Monetary Policy Committee, or referred to as the MPC makes the most important decisions, including the Bank of England base rate and the actions over quantitative easing. Their main aim is to keep inflation at 2% and if it goes below 1% or above 3% the Governor of the Bank of England has to write a letter to the Chancellor of the Exchequer explaining why this has happened and what the Bank of England is doing to bring it back to the target. They use CPI in order to see whether this target has been met. Since 2009, the MPC has kept the bank rate at half a percent and policy has become focused on boosting economic growth and employment. It was reduced to 0.25% following the Brexit vote but rose again in November 2017 due to the inflation that the weak pound brought about. They plan to raise the interest rate once the negative output gap has been eliminated and the economy is growing strongly. The committee is made up of nine people. Five are from the Bank of England, including the Governor of the Bank of England, and the other four are independent outside experts, mainly economists. Moving on, we will now talk about fiscal policy. There are two main ways the government can increase aggregate demand through fiscal policy. Firstly, a rise in income tax will cause a fall in disposable income. This will lead to a reduction in consumption and thus decrease aggregate demand. Alternatively, a rise in corporation tax will decrease a firm's post-tax profits. This will lead to a reduction in investment and thus decrease aggregate demand. A rise in government spending will increase aggregate demand since it is one component. What is a government budget? The government's fiscal, spending, borrowing, and taxation plans are outlined in the budget. A budget deficit is when the government spends more money than they receive. A budget surplus is when the government receives more money than they spend. So, let's look at indirect and direct taxation. Direct taxes are paid directly to the government by the individual taxpayer. An indirect tax is where the person charged with paying the money to the government is able to pass on the cost to someone else, for instance, the supplier can pass on the burden to indirect tax to the consumer. The four highest revenue raising taxes are income tax, national insurance, VAT, and corporation tax. Other taxes include council tax, excise duties, capital gains tax, inheritance taxes, and stamp duty land tax. It is a good idea to have an understanding of the different rates of tax in the UK. For example, 
Income tax is a direct tax and is the biggest source of revenue for the government, around 25% of all taxation revenue. It is paid as a percentage of income and L income earned below a certain threshold is not taxed. This is £11,850 as of summer 2018. The basic rate is 20%, the higher rate is 40% and 45% is the additional rate for incomes over £150,000. VAT is an indirect tax and the standard rate of VAT is 20%. Not all goods pay the standard rate, for example, food and children's clothes aren't charged and domestic fuel and power are charged at 5%. There are problems that need to be considered when evaluating fiscal policy. Government spending also impacts long-run aggregate supply. For example, by cutting government spending to reduce aggregate demand, the government may be reducing the quality of education or spending on research and technology. Taxes and spending have an impact on inequality, so some decisions aimed to reduce or increase demand may increase income inequality. They also have an impact on incentives, for example, high taxes reduce incentives. The government also has to worry about political issues. For example, they may be unwilling to raise taxes in order to reduce demand as this may lead to them being voted out of government. Expansionary fiscal policy is difficult to undertake during a period of austerity. The government needs to consider the effect of policies on the budget. The impact of fiscal policy depends on the multiplier. The bigger the multiplier, the bigger the impact on aggregate demand. Classical economists argue that the multiplier is almost zero whilst Keynesian economists argue that it can be large if targeted correctly. So, let's evaluate demand-side policies. It is clear there are some issues with the individual policies, for example, the effect on the budget following fiscal policy or hyperinflation risks with quantitative easing. However, demand-side policies, on the whole, have some issues. Classical economists argue that any demand management, whether fiscal or monetary, will have no effect on long-run output so supply-side policies should be used. They believe that increasing aggregate demand during a depression will have no effect other than to increase prices. If the economy is in short-run disequilibrium, it will quickly return to long-run equilibrium, whilst Keynesians argue that it can be in long-run equilibrium for years. On a Keynesian long-run aggregate supply, the impact of changes in aggregate demand depends on where the economy is operating. If the economy is at full employment then a rise in aggregate demand will only lead to higher prices. However, if unemployment is very high, then a rise in aggregate demand will only lead to higher output. Both policies see significant time lags between their introduction and their full effect. The biggest issue of demand-side policies is that, in most cases, an expansionary policy is inflationary whilst a deflationary policy brings unemployment. This depends on the elasticity of the curve and the curve which you perceive to be correct, be that Keynesian or classical, but holds in most scenarios. Thus, through demand management, the government cannot bring about both low and stable inflation and high economic growth and low unemployment. Let's look at monetary versus fiscal policy. Monetary policy is useful as the government is able to increase demand without having to increase its spending, which would result in a larger fiscal deficit. Classicists argue that if demand management is going to be done only monetary policy should be used. Fiscal policy can have significant impacts on the supply side of the economy, for example, increases in spending on education to increase aggregate demand will also increase long-run aggregate supply. Moreover, it is more effective at targeting specific groups and reduce poverty, for example by increasing benefits it can increase aggregate demand and reduce inequality. A range of demand-side policies should be used alongside other policies, such as supply-side policies, in order to achieve all the government's goals. Any government decision will also have microeconomic impacts. For example, a government decision to reduce tax will allow firms to have higher post-tax profits. This may increase investment and therefore increase efficiency. Thank you for watching our video. Please like, subscribe and share. And comment below so we can clarify things for you.